Well, thank you very much for joining us here tonight. We are very pleased here at Newcastle University to be, to be contributing to the 1900th uh, celebrations for the kind of the construction of Hadrian's Wall. Um, and so I'm thrilled to see so many people in the audience tonight. We have a fantastic panel here for you uh, who are experts of various fields. We'll hear more about that in a few moments. But first, I'd just like to lay a few minutes worth of foundation, as it were, because when you get a number of Hadrian's Wall experts together, we start talking in a language of our own. Um, before we jump into that, though, as well, this has been, of course, a, a fantastic year of celebrations for us, but of course, as many of us know, there's also been trials and tribulations. Uh, for those of us sitting here just this past week, we've lost uh, three keen friends of the wall and Roman archaeology. Um, Paul Bidwell, who is an expert in Roman pottery studies and worked at Arbea Roman Fort uh, and for TWAM, uh, unfortunately died over the weekend. Uh, and his work on Roman pottery and Roman archaeology is a, is a very le lasting legacy for all of us. Um, another colleague, Lisa Ludwig, was also lost recently. Uh, and she was a fantastic and inspiring uh, Roman archaeologist looking into all sorts of pressing and dynamic issues in, in the Roman Empire. And most recently, of course, uh, Jenny Duquesne, who in the past year donated the Roman Fort of Karabruf uh, into the trust of the nation. Um, so while we're here to celebrate tonight, we're able to celebrate because of the fantastic work of friends and colleagues uh, around the country. With that somber note aside, we will jump into the wall. Now, one of the things I would like to highlight is that while you have a, a number of living experts here in front of us, that Hadrian's Wall has been something that Newcastle University has been deeply engaged with, even before, in fact, it was Newcastle University, when we were, um, when we were King's College of Durham University, in fact. And you can see here a, a very, very simple outline of at least of centuries of engagements with the wall. One of the things to highlight here is that many of those engagements, to put it in modern parlance, have been very large, very complex, and very earth-shattering excavations. Uh, which have uncovered incredible new evidence and advanced the entire field of Roman archaeology. That's one strand of Newcastle's engagement with Hadrian's Wall, a commitment to field archaeology. The other, of course, is a commitment to the study of material culture and artifacts. And one of the best examples of that is when the Museum of Antiquities uh, was placed on campus in 1956 uh, in conjunction with, in collaboration with the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon time. Um, now, the Museum of Antiquities closed in 2009, but that's because it joined a new partnership with the Natural History Society and Tyne and Weir Archives and Museums, and those collections now reside across the road in the Great North Museum. But that has set, as I say, a century's worth of foundation uh, that has shaped uh, former students, uh, such as Tony here, who is a, an excellent alumni of, of Newcastle. Uh, it shapes the work of current members of staff, like Ian and myself, and of the students we have now who hopefully will progress into future careers and look at Hadrian's Wall. So it's that commitment to that material culture study, which I think makes you Castle's offering so unique. Now, I would like to think that everyone in this room knows exactly where you are. You are here, after all. We're in Newcastle, um, just at the east end of Hadrian's Wall. But I put this map up, hopefully that you can keep it in mind through the rest of the night, is, is uh, members of our panel talk about particular sites or areas of the wall. Um, and of course, we are at the northern fringe of the Roman Empire, and Hadrian's Wall being what I think of as the belt uh, that holds up the britches of the northern frontier. And so it's not just Hadrian's Wall, which is important, but actually how it connects with the much uh, wider frontier landscape that it was a part of. In that sense, Hadrian's Wall is not just a wall. It's a, a very complex monument with a very long history, um, and it's defined by the landscape that it sits within, but it also helps further define that frontier landscape. And it's not just the windswept rocky crags that make it onto all the tourist brochures, as I'm sure many of you in this room know. Uh, there's a diversity of landscapes. If we go over to the west end of the wall, you've got the salt marshes that you can see here at Bonnes. Uh, you've got gently rolling farmlands, you can see here outside of Braswald and here outside of Chester's. Then, of course, you have urban Tyneside, where the West Road marks the course of Hadrian's Wall. So when we think about Hadrian's Wall, you have to think about these different landscapes and also the different communities that live along it in a contemporary sense, but also in a historic sense. And one of the final things to remind you, when we get going, people might start talking that confusing wall language. 
Okay, there are a number of different elements of Hadrian's Wall, and so these are just a few of the kind of terms that might come up tonight. So I, I put this down as a reminder of what those are. There is, of course, Hadrian's Wall, which is composed of a, of a stone curtain. But when we think of Hadrian's Wall as a monument, there's this ditch to the north of the curtain. Then to the south, there's this road, the military way. And then we have this structure, this earthwork structure known as the vallum, which is a central ditch and a mound to either side. So you have a layered system moving from north to south. Structures along the wall include turrets, which in most other places would be called towers, but we have our own language for the wall. You have mile castles, which as the name suggests are built every Roman mile with two turrets in between, so every third of a mile. And then approximately every seven and a half mile, we have these much larger forts, the main bases for the Roman soldiers that garrison the wall. Now, Hadrian's Wall had a very long life. Um, you can see here that it had a lifespan of you know, approximately 300 years. And if you think about what that means uh, in more contemporary terms, pitch yourself back 300 years. How different was the place then? We have to consider that change through time for Hadrian's Wall. Writ large, the Roman life of the monument is only about, I forget what I did the math there, 15% of its total lifespan. And so actually much more of the life has exist, of the wall has existed after the Roman period came to an end. And it's that post-Roman life that's also affected the monument we see today and many of the various issues and pressing concerns that we're also dealing with today. So with those facts in mind, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. We have Lady Jane Gibson, we have Tony Wilmot, we have Alice Price, and we have Ian Haynes. Now, they will each have a, a more prolonged introduction to introduce themselves. But one of the key things I want you to go into this panel think, uh, remembering is that actually each of these people represents a, a different sector or particular interest in Hadrian's Wall and the broader heritage sector itself. And so that's done intentionally so that we get a range of different perspectives here tonight. Okay, Jane, if I start with you, and then we'll move on to the other panelists. So I would like you, please, for the audience, to tell us what your profession is and how you engage with the wall through your work. And, sorry, what does that mean uh, in terms of your priorities or focus on your work and, and how that impacts in your daily life? Uh, I'm the chair of the Hadrian's Wall Partnership Board. So, as you know, we're a World Heritage Site, and so uh, we have a strange governance structure because I'm the chair of a group of people who have no legal entity. We are not a legal entity. We're there because we need to be there because we are responsible for the management plan of the World Heritage Site. And we're there because we want to be there because everybody wants to make sure that there is synergy uh, along the wall. So I, um, I reach that position because I've, I've got long experience of working um, in the Northeast. So despite the fact I currently live in Ibarakum, uh, the legionary fortress in York, and during COVID, I have to say, I got a bit bored with walking around the legionary fortress and was missing Hadrian's Wall desperately. Uh, but I've got a long association with, uh, with the Northeast. I moved from London to the Northeast in 1994, and I did all sorts of regeneration work in, uh, in the Northeast and in Northumberland and in Tyneside. So I have a long association with the wall. Um, so I am a volunteer chair. I just do um, voluntary governance now. Um, so my profession is a volunteer, like many of you here tonight. Thank you, Jane. Tony, same question to you. Uh, your profession and, and effectively your engagements with the wall. Right. Um, well, I'm a senior archaeologist with Historic England. Uh, my employment with Historic England started at the beginning of a three-year contract in 1987, which managed to extend to 35 years. Um, and um, having been um, an alumnus, as you said, of uh, Newcastle University, my undergraduate training excavation in 1976 was Barrett Black 13 at Housted. Um, and I was away, after graduating in 1977, I was away from the wall zone for 10 years doing archeology span elsewhere. When I came back, it was to excavate on the, uh, do research excavations on the wall fort uh, of Bird Oswald. And since then, I've done 13 seasons at Bird Oswald, the last two this year and last, and the next two and the next two years with my friend and colleague Ian Haynes, a joint project between Historic England and the university. I've also excavated in 13 Mile Castle, was seen a section through the Vallum three times, 
I dug temples, I dug a cemetery. In fact, there's only two things, two elements of Hadrian's Wall that I've never put a shovel into, and those are a turret and a bridge. So I dig it up and research it. That's what I do. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Tony. Elsa. Hi, um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Elsa. I'm the curator for um, human history at Tully House Museum, which is the principal museum of Cumbria in Carlisle. Um, so my job involves both archaeology and social history. Uh, so I range from the Paleolithic right to the modern day, um, but a huge section of my work is taken up with caring for our Roman collections. Um, so essentially, I look after the stuff that Tony and likewise archaeologists dig up. Um, I keep them in store, I keep them safe, uh, and I provide access to researchers, and I, I work to interpret them uh, in galleries and <coughs> to members of the public. If I could, could you just expand a little bit on mm. what you mean when you say uh, interpretation in oh, galleries for the public? Sorry, interpretation, yeah. So I suppose the role of the museum is to be the bridge between um, both the archaeologists and the academics, and to take uh, current thinking and present it in a way that can be understood by everybody from school children right the way through to lifelong learners. Um, and we do, gosh, a huge range of activities. So that could be permanent galleries when you go to visit a museum. Uh, the, the, the stuff that's on display for many years, um, temporary exhibitions, touring exhibitions, uh, we organise talks and programming. Um, in fact, next week we are being taken over by Romans for our Roman week. Um, we have Time Bandits coming, doing a whole range of um, school children engagement. Um, and we also partner with other organisations. So recently we partnered with Wardell Armstrong, who are an archaeological unit, to excavate um, the exceptionally exciting bathhouse at Stanix. And if you haven't heard about it, definitely look it up because it's absolutely incredible. So yeah, no day is the same in the life of a curator. Thank you, Asa. And Ian? Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really good to see so many friends and colleagues here today. Um, I'm Ian Haynes. I'm Professor of Archaeology here at Newcastle. Uh, my work is primarily on the Roman Empire, uh, and I've had the very good fortune to work in many parts of the empire. Uh, I work quite a lot on archaeological method as well. Uh, coming closer to home here, uh, I've been fortunate to uh, direct excavations at Maryport and Bird Oswald, both times with, with, <coughs> with Tony here, um, and large area projects at uh, Corbridge uh, and Beckford. I am chair of the Clayton Trust for Roman Antiquities, so we look after that lovely museum with our friends at uh, English Heritage, uh, Chester's and uh, I am a director trustee of the Vindolanda Trust. Great, thank you very much. So to just fix that in everyone's mind, we have uh, Jane who's able to talk a bit about the heritage sector more widely and how the wall interacts with that. Uh, Tony who brings uh, excellent experience of firsthand excavation, and uh, direction of excavation, interpreted those excavation results. Elsa, whose uh, daily life, which is never the same, is still looking after the collections and thinking very much about the care of material culture and how they're interpreted and presented to the public. Um, and Ian, who's uh, leading on a whole series of research endeavors as well. So in that sense, we, we have a very broad coverage here of how different professions engage with the wall, which is important. So my next question, and I'm going to start here with you, Tony. How does Hadrian's Wall contribute to our understanding of history and archeology? span uh, at a general level, and also for our region? Um, it's quite a difficult one, actually. Um, it obviously is, the wall is the basis of a huge landscape, and as you said earlier, on a landscape which has continuity through through time, you know, I mean, from, from the Roman period, and not only from the Roman period. Every time you, every time you excavate underneath the Roman remains, uh, every excavation that's gone beneath the earthworks or the forts, all the way from Wall's End to Carabruff, um, has produced evidence of prehistoric ploughing underneath, you know, plough scars from prehistoric ploughing. So we're looking, we're not looking at, for a start, of Hadrian's Wall entering an empty landscape. It's a peopled landscape and it's a utilised landscape. So it's farmed and it's pastured. Um, so we, the archaeolo archaeological excavation on Hadrian's Wall, in a sense, Hadrian's Wall actually. Um, covers, seals, and protects a prehistoric landscape even before it's built. 
uh, the prehistoric landscape underneath is a major um, contribution to vegetational history going right the way back. Um, obviously, more, more recently, once Hadrian's Wall is built, once the features are there, um, it has multiple uses through the rest um, of, of, of history, through the Middle Ages, through the, um, through the post-medieval period. Um, houses are built within the forts, within the mile castles. Um, fortified houses are built, particularly on the Cumbrian side, vassal houses, within the forts, within the mile castles. These, these places are utilized for a long period afterwards. So re in the regional landscape, it, the archaeology of Hadrian's Wall is really important. If you, if you, for instance, go five miles south of Hadrian's Wall, five miles north of Hadrian's Wall, and look at the dry stone walls in all the, in all the fields, you will see that they are different. In that central zone of about 10 miles, um, the central sort of belt of 10 miles, it's all reused Roman stone. And you can see it's reused Roman stone. Five miles south, five miles north, it isn't Roman stone anymore. It's new quarried stone. So that, you know, it's left its mark on the landscape in a, in, a, in a massive way. And of course, in my experience of excavation over the years, you know, people, you occasionally hear this idea that, uh, oh, we know everything about Hadrian's Wall, you know, it's all been sorted out. Every single excavation in you know, 35 years of digging on Hadrian's Wall, every single excavation throws up something new, throws up new questions, there's answers to old questions, but actually more new questions than answers to old questions. So it's a continuous process of trying to understand not just the Roman past, but the deep prehistoric past and um, the present day landscape right up to, right up to it as, as um, a monument within the modern landscape. How's that? Great, thank you. So, so from trowel's edge to kind of uh, paper files, Jane, what does that mean for you then, sitting uh, at, the, at the chair of the Hadrian's Wall Partnership Board? Um, obviously, there's all this fantastic archaeology, but, you know, in your position, how is Hadrian's Wall contributing to society and modern life? Well, well because <clears throat> there's just something about that wall in, that, in this landscape. I mean, it's really, really significant to me. This is, this is, you hear talk of the Northern Powerhouse. Hadrian's Wall was the Northern Powerhouse. It, it is, to me, the, the, the ultimate symbol of the importance of this part of the world that we're in now, then, and c continuing. But we start with the archaeology. So chairing the board of Hadrian's Wall doesn't mean that you can get away with making stuff up. Because we have you know, literally internationally cutting edge science. We have the, the, the and I have the, had this discussion with Ian and Tony earlier on in the year at the, at the excavation at Bird Oswald. One of the things that our visitors and, and because of course so many visitors engage with Hadrian's Wall through, you know, through, through websites, through television programs, through books, through the, the, the study, is that, is that we, People really like the fact that we are developing cutting-edge science on Hadrian's Wall. So you get something which is 2,000 years old, and we, we know so much about it. So we know that Hadrian arrived in AD 122 in June or July. Good time. Good time to come to the northeast, June or July. Really good time, really lovely weather. We know that his favourite food was game pie. Like, I know more about what was happening 2,000 years ago in this part of the world than I know, you know, that what was happening in, in my family in the, in the 50s. So we just know such a lot because of the academic depth and the interest and the passion in it. But I don't, I'm not an archaeologist, and I, uh, I am jolly glad that around the governance of Hadrian's Wall, there are a lot of people with a lot of knowledge of that. So you start with the base. The, the base is knowledge that we have, and all of my fellow panel members have that knowledge, so we don't make stuff up. And Bill Griffiths, who's in the audience tonight, Bill always says to me, you can say what you like, Jane, just don't say the Vallum was a canal, because it really, really wasn't. So there are, there are stuff that, that, you know, there's stuff that we, we, we don't, we, we have the knowledge about because of the, of the academic rigour and of, and of the science. But the importance of Hadrian's Wall to me is what it means to people now. So I want the communities around Hadrian's Wall to be making money from it. I want businesses to be stronger 
because of that association with Hadrian's Wall, because undoubtedly that's what they were, they were buying and selling 2,000 years ago, the people who lived around the wall. So to me, it's the importance of the communities and what we offer. So we, we, you know, as our, we're in the middle, we're right at, right at the beginning actually of what we're calling our 10-year investment program. And that is really just to generate pride, money, interest for the communities who live around the wall because they deserve it, because it's theirs. It is a world heritage site and it is theirs, it is ours. So that's the bit that I hope to be able to bring to the, uh, to the discussion. Great, thank you. Elsa. In your perspective, then, mm. from sitting in a museum, you know, how do you see Hadrian's Wall contributing uh, to the region? So for me, um, Hadrian's Wall is about material culture because that's the part that I care for. So that's the physical objects that are dug out of the ground. Um, and I think it's in the material culture that we can really get an insight or a little window into the people who lived along Hadrian's Wall. Uh, and for me, that's important because museums, they're a site of... Um, inspiration, of lifelong learning, of curiosity. I think they should be places where, that we come to to understand not just the past, but how that past should affect and influence now and the future. So understanding people of the past can help us inform people of today and the people we want to be going forward. So a small example would be um, the insight into diversity that we can see through the objects. So that might be um, North African vaulting tubes that were used um, on the inside of buildings. So we had some of these from the Stanex bathhouse just outside of Carlisle. Um, we had an inscription to um, the Emperor Severus's, so either his wife or his mother, there's a little bit of um, debate about that, but he was the first African emperor. He was potentially in Carlisle. We have North African vaulting tubes. Um, we have um, a gravestone of somebody who died in, uh, who died in Carlisle but came from modern day Algeria. Um, you can go on and on about the breadth um, of people that lived here from, from Dacia to Germany to Spain, other continents beyond um, Europe. So for me, those stories and those insights to the people who lived here that we can see through their objects is the most important element. And that should help inform us, um, especially as a museum, to promote tolerance and understanding and to really dig deep and think about what kind of future do we want um, and what kind of past we had and how they can talk to each other so that we can have a, a happier, happier planet, happier country going forward. So nothing too small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Elsa. And actually, in that, in some ways, segues into your research interests quite nicely, you know, the, the diversity of, of different people that were here during the Roman Empire. You know, is that something for you that... that lends itself, uh, increases your interest in Hadrian's Wall? Thank you. Um, I think Elsa's made some really super points there. Um, yes, at the end of the day, I'm really drawn to the wall because of people. And I think that works actually right the way through. I'm drawn to the wall, to the wall community today, for precisely the reasons that Jane outlined. And I'm drawn to the wall because of what it tells us about other communities. And in some ways, the richness of the data we've got about people through time has come about almost as a byproduct of some of those early researchers who are interested in rather different questions. Many of them were often interested in structures and sequences. But a result is that we've amassed a huge amount of data. And one of the things that is so exciting we talk about the disciplines of history, we talk about the disciplines of archaeology, but actually, with the wall, those two disciplines unlock a whole array of other areas of expertise. So it is marvellous. Sometimes it's admittedly not the conversation you want immediately before lunch, but it's marvellous to discuss with ancient parasitology experts how their research will unlock our understanding of people. It's marvellous. There are so many different ways we can do this. And I think they do draw on a number of very positive lessons. They speak about issues of resilience, adaptation. But I have to say that they also remind us of some very brutal truths that we forget, of course, at our peril. And we do need to remember that when we talk about what the big deal is, we are still looking at what is an artifact in the first instance 
of a strategy of military control imposed by a brutal despot in practice on a probably largely unwilling population. And so we can celebrate many things about the people who've endured in that environment and continue to work with it today, and we should. They're all shapes and sizes, and they all have something for us to connect with. But there's also blood in this story, and we forget that at our peril. Thank you. Now, the next question is also to our panel members, but we're going to go in order because there are visual props to this. And so, given the different backgrounds <laughs> of our panelists, I posed the question to them if they had a favorite fact, historical episode, site, or object from the wall. Now, I'll start with Jane, who submitted this intriguing photo, not of an object or a site, but of a person. So <laughs> yes, please, Jane. I'm not objectifying <laughs> Gary Pickles at, at my, uh, I, would never, I would never do that. So Gary is the uh, National Trail Manager, so he looks after the National Trail. And Gary, um, I, I, Lancashire lad, uh, is just fingertip knowledge. I mean, so many of my colleagues on Hadrian's Wall have fingertip knowledge, and they all wear it very lightly, which just makes it such a pleasurable project. But Gary, so I, I, I walked a bit of the wall in, uh, in, in May, and actually the reason why it's such a cut-off photograph is because I haven't included uh, Neil Redfern, who is the chief executive of the Council for British Archaeology, who was standing the other side of Gary. But um, so Neil and I did, did uh, Gary, uh, Neil worked, walked the whole wall. I just did little bits and pieces of the, of the days with him. But on that particular, we were at Limestone Corner, and on that particular morning, Gary um, point, uh, I pointed out an iris. So there's some irises growing along that Limestone Corner part of the wall. And he said, oh, that's, that's he said, that's number 19. That's iris number 19. So when we're talking about fingertip knowledge and respect and love, he has actually numbered the rare plants. And, and, and th this is sort of normal for people who work on Hadrian's Wall, is that there is just something about this, you call it a project, call it a monument, call it... It's, it's not like other things, and it's not like other places. There's a magic about it. There's an aura about Hadrian's Wall. There's, there's, a, there's sensations you can receive by being involved in it. Many of you will know this. You've, you'll have your own experiences. And, and Gary, <coughs> Gary stewards and respects the wall as in his role as, as managing the National Trail so that... The, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who enjoy our World Heritage Site as they walk it, they, they, they spend time with Gary and, and they take away this, this wonderful, this, this, they take our passion around the, back to wherever they're going in the world. So we owe Gary for looking after our, our trail. So he is my <coughs> favorite object. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. So, Tony, you are next up. Your favourite thing. Can I cheat and stand up? If you like. I need to point. Um, my favourite site. Would you like the laser pointer? Thank you. Red button there. The red button. Um, my favourite site is, well, um, surprise nobody who knows me, it's uh, Bird Oswald Roman Fort um, on Hadrian's Wall, just on the east side. Part of, one of the most complicated parts of Hadrian's Wall because this is the part where you have the uh, original wall built in turf. Can you all hear me? Go on. Thank you, Jim. I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm being a bit of a show off here, aren't I? <laughs> Is this? Oh, yeah. Um, so here's the, uh, here's the fort. It's in the segment where the initial curtain wall of Hadrian's Wall is built in turf, and it is then subsequently replaced in stone. But at Bird Oswald, it's the only place to, for uh, two miles from Bird Oswald westwards where the turf wall and the stone wall are on different lines. So it's the only place where you can see the turf wall as an archaeological monument without the stone wall on top of it. That's the background to the object. So there is the stone wall running along the road, joining up with the north corners of Bird Oswald Fort. And the line of the turf wall, see this earthwork here? That's the turf wall ditch running down the field. Dee, 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 dee. And the turf wall goes to there through. It predates the fort, so it runs through the middle of the site of the fort and out the other side. 
Now, when we were excavating in this area in 1987, we'd got underneath the road of the fort and we were in the material of the turf wall. We were actually in the turfs of the turf wall. The bottom two turves survived. And I was on my hands and knees digging, thank you, and um, I turned over this dark turf and saw the natural soil underneath and the little red thing about the size of my thumbnail. So I picked it up and I turned it over and I rubbed the dirt off from the thumb and there was Roman imperial eagle with a laurel wreath in its beak flanked by two imperial standards. Now there's only one way that could have got there and what I'm talking here is object and context to key factors, the key factor in archaeology, object and context. What it is, what it says, where it comes from. And there's only one way this thing could have got to where it came from, and that is by being dropped by one of the legionary builders of Hadrian's Wall in 122, 123, or thereabouts. So that was dropped by one of the builders. They put a turf on top of it by accident. Maybe didn't even know it had fallen out of his ring, but it had been there ever since until I picked it up. And here you see, and it's, it's also the motif on the, on the stone. It's the imperial eagle. They're legionary standards. This guy's a legionary soldier, and he believes in this stuff. You know, he believes in Rome. He believes in Rome's mission. He believes in the army. Otherwise, he wouldn't wear that thing. Yeah. And when I turned that over and rubbed it off, I thought there was an immediate ping, um, straight back to somebody, people, straight back to somebody who was here, who was part of that operation. Sorry, that's a long lecture. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you, Tony. Elsa, your favourite thing. Yes, I have many. I have no favourite things. Everything is my favourite thing. <laughs> All objects are equal. But this one is particularly interesting. I think it highlights um, the cause of museums, really, in one object, because it's very apt to our current political climate. Um, so this is the Crozier Stone. Um, it's a milestone found in Carlisle, Carlisle District. Um, if you don't know of this man, he was the original king in the north, or emperor in the north, um, and he was around in the third century. Uh, so there's a bit of a crisis in the third century. A big chunk of Gaul declares independence, um, and just 10, year, 10 years or so after Rome gets a handle on a runaway Gaul, um, Crozius declares himself emperor of Britain and northern Gaul and breaks away from the empire. Um, he rules for about seven years before he's assassinated by his financial advisor and <laughs> <laughs> the F emperor um, manages to take back control. I think he is then subsequently overthrown um, and it's all a bit, you know, difficult. Um, but what's amazing about this stone is that Carosius um, suffered uh, the fate of being scrubbed from history. But I am assuming here that when the stonemasons were sent to scrub out his name from this milestone, they instead just picked it up, turned it around, and wrote the victor's name on the bottom. You can just see the C-A-E-S at the bottom. Um, so Carosius' bit is at the top. So I believe um, that this might be if not the only, one of the only inscriptions of Crozius surviving in the UK. Um, and I think it's one of those objects that we can really use to reflect on today. I mean, you've got the crisis of the third century, and then we kind of have a little bit of a political crisis at the moment. Um, we've had everything from Scottish independence, um, Brexit, several different prime ministers. Um, and no matter what side of the fence you sit on on that, it's easy to see that political deviancy and a rebellion is nothing that's new. It's always happened. Um, and I just think this object sums that up. And it's, you can feel patriotic, patriotic about it, or you can feel that he was a bit of a bad egg. It's quite a nice. So even yeah. 1,700 years ago, finance yeah. ministers were wreaking havoc for Britain. <laughs> <clears throat> and Ian, your favorite location, I guess, in this instance. Yes, I'm cheating slightly here because I, I, I can pick up on a thread earlier on. Um, one of the most important things about what I do is I have the privilege to work with students. And we're all students here, really, or at least I hope we are all students. Um, that's why we're here at an insights session. Um, I work with many different types of students, and these students are actually 
or international students who are not archaeologists, but they've come to Newcastle because they know Newcastle is a great place. Many of this group are, in fact, maritime engineers, um, but they are here to look in the process at Hadrian's Wall. And the spot, the location, uh, Rob suggested to me, when I was thinking about sites, and I thought, well, I suspect that another panellist might have dibs on Bird Oswald, and I thought, maybe I won't talk about sites that I've had the privilege of, of excavating or surveying. This is something that was studied by another colleague, actually, uh, Jim Crow, and it tells you a huge amount about Hadrian's Wall in just one glimpse. We are at Peel Gap, and when Jim was set the task of excavating the stretch of curtain wall here, I think he thought it was just going to be another stretch of Hadrian's Wall. And then he found a turret, and you can see that little box over there. He found a turret. Now, everybody had been taught that there were two turrets between mile castles, pairs of mile castles on Hadrian's Wall. This stretch has three turrets, including that turret, which wasn't, according to all of our theories, supposed to be there. Now, a couple of things that are very interesting about this. One of them is that it is not actually part of the initial sequence. So someone has decided that it's worth adding a turret to the wall at this point. <coughs> and the second one, so that first of all reminds us about the tension between top-down idealized plans of a wall. And then the second thing is where it is. And it is, as the name suggests, at Peel Gap. It is in what, in military terms, is dead ground between the viewing points from turrets either side. It's a relatively narrow space, but I think that what this reminds us of is not only the capacity of the people on the ground to adapt the wall, it tells us something fairly fundamental about the way they see the wall operating as a structure of control. Even this relatively narrow gap has to be plugged. And I think that's a very interesting glimpse of how the wall works and what it means to people who once upon a time or whose predecessors could move north to south without any of these unfortunate interruptions. Thank you. It's a very good selection uh, of choices there. Now, if we move on to the, the next question, and actually in this case, I think, Ian, I'll, I'll start uh, with you as it follows on directly from this image. In the course of that work as a university lecture, um, besides students, are, are there other groups, communities that you're coming into contact with who are interested or engaged with the wall? And, and something that springs to mind, of course, is the Hadrian's Wall MOOC, the, the online learning yeah, um, yeah, yeah. course. Well, thank you. I think, I think the privilege that comes with being in a university position and being able to research on a World Heritage site brings with it responsibilities. And probably one of the first ones is to share. And the second one, I think, is to express gratitude because the work that is done on the wall is always done, in essence, in conjunction with other people. Other people who work the land, other people who actually provide the infrastructure to support our work. Um, and it is a fantastic thing to actually be able to share, therefore, what is a common heritage with people, whether they're coming from overseas or whether they're coming from just down the road. And you always learn from that interaction as well. Now, when I saw in a draft of questions, you know, itemise who, which groups you've worked with, I thought that's a rather terrifying question because I suspect for all four of us panellists, and for Rob as well, of course, um, that list is very, very long. And I wouldn't want to leave anyone out of it. But the truth is from, you know, the, uh, we've had fantastic community volunteers uh, working with us on projects right the way across the length of the wall, marvellous students, tremendous public engagement, fantastic colleagues from across the museum sector, colleagues in historic England, Engli English heritage from a range of uh, universities, and a range of people who are volunteering in such fundamentally important ways that we couldn't operate. None of us could operate without them. So. The great thing about this wall is it does connect us uh, not just to the past, it connects us to one another in a lot of really exciting ways. Thank you. We'll move back down the line. So Elsa, <laughs> um, you're locked in a museum. Do you get to talk to anyone ever? <laughs> they do let me out the store sometimes. Um, in fact, actually, museums uh, have really changed, I guess, over the last, gosh, 
since the 1950s or so. Um, so the idea of the, the curator um, ruling the museum and uh, holding their objects like Smog the Dragon and let no one touch anything is <laughs> gone. Um, museums are now places of creativity and access and we're continually trying to balance um, collections care, so making sure that you know the objects are going to survive for as long as we possibly can let them survive for, um, and at the same time be accessed and enjoyed um, by people. So that's kind of our forever balancing act. Um, so alongside that, we like to work with academics and experts, but also um, community members. And we found that actually working with communities has been one of the most effective ways to really get that one-to-one -one interaction with, with material culture. So I would say my favorite group of people to work with have been the diggers at the bathhouse in Carlisle. Um, in Carlisle, we, we were the biggest fort on Hadrian's Wall at Stanix. We had two forts. Um, we had the crack cavalry unit stationed there. We were a big cheese back in the day. But if you walk through Carlisle today and you didn't know it was on Hadrian's Wall, you would come away none the wiser because we suffer from a lack of um, physical finds. Um, and Carlisle hadn't had an excavation in the city since about the 2000s. So that's 20 years of people not really seeing their heritage in front of them as they walk through the city. So to have this dig and to see the community come together was just absolutely magical. They've done follow-up digs, they've got follow-up funding. There's an entire community of Carlisle-based people who never knew um, about their <coughs> Roman heritage. And not only do they know about it, they're actually engaged in it. They physically dug it up you know, on their hands and knees with a trowel um, and engaged with us to help bring those finds to life in an exhibition. So I think really it's about the people that you're working with, giving them that access, that hands-on access to collections, whilst balancing that care, has been my favourite aspect of working with colleagues and communities. Thank you, Elsa. Is that true for you as well, Tony? Has that community engagement been central, or do you find yourself um, getting to deal with yes, other types well, of it has, but not quite in the same to the same extent as Elsa. I mean, my. I, I obviously work for a statutory organisation for a start, so uh, you know I deal with colleagues who are responsible for uh, protection, for giving um, consent for um, excavations for research work, scheduled monument consent under the 1979 Ancient Monuments and Historic Areas Act. Um, and um, even working for Historic England, English Heritage before that, even as part of the organisation, I still have to apply through the Inspector of Ancient Monuments to the Secretary of State to work. And I also get a certain amount of work, a certain amount of uh, work actually looking at other proposals for, which are put forward for, for, for scheduled ancient monument consent. So from the statutory point of view, that's different from others. But apart from that, I would echo exactly everything that uh, Ian just said. Um, because in order to put a project on the ground, you have to deal with the landowners. You have to, you have to sometimes manage expectations in different in different ways. Um, my earlier work was with professional archaeologists. I had professional archaeologists working for me. Um, since with, when working with Ian at Maryport, that community engagement was big, um, and now again working with with Ian at, uh, at Bird Oswald over the next couple of years. Fantastic students. I mean, these 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 were great people. We really, I really enjoyed them. And, um, you know, scales fell from my eyes. Your <laughs> students are great, great people. But I think um, the other, the, the additional thing that I'd add is an international perspective, bearing in mind that, of course, Hadrian's Wall is the first part, as a World Heritage Site, is the first part of an international world heritage site of the frontiers of the Roman Empire, which currently encompasses Hadrian's Wall, the Antonine Wall, the German Limes, the um, frontier in the Netherlands, and the upper, the upper Danube, so, and other areas, the, uh, the rest of the Danube frontier, Dacia, Romania, they are, also, they are all moving forward with their designation. And it is a single world heritage site called Frontiers of the Roman Empire, of which Hadrian's Wall is a part. So we have those international connections. They're exemplified by the Roman Frontiers Congress, the Limes Congress, which happens every three years. Rob and I just had a whale of a time in the Netherlands over a couple of, couple of months ago, uh, the Limes Congress. 
And another sort of child of, the, of world heritage on the wall is a relationship with the Great Wall of China, in the wall-to-wall -wall relationship, where, and we've already had Chinese colleagues coming over here. Um, we have been, um, Bill was there, or Rob was there, I was there. We have gone to China to look at the Chinese uh, wall, held, held alternate seminars, both in Newcastle and in a place called Jinshanling, uh, which is a splendid part of the Great Wall. Um, and indeed, we, had, uh, we were able to introduce um, a Chinese academic colleague at the Limes Congress and introduce a, um, and introduce, um, a session on the Great Wall of China into Roman frontier studies in the wider Roman frontier. And all of this comes really from Hadrian's Wall and from the study of Hadrian's Wall widening out. The Limos Congress itself is a child of the pilgrimage of Hadrian's Wall, which has happened every 10 years, uh, not quite since 1848, but you know what I mean. Um, the, the Roman Frontiers Congress is a child of that, and that's grown. And then you've got the, the international dimension of the whole frontiers of the Roman Empire, and then the Chinese connection. So in addition to um, Ian's great catalogue of, uh, of contacts, we have those international contacts as well, which, which, I, which I treasure greatly. Thank you, Tom. And would you say that's the same for you, Jane? Yes. But, uh, I mean, I've just written down everybody, literally everyone, literally everybody. But I do have another couple of groups that haven't been mentioned. Um, so uh, in, um, on June the 2nd, which was the first day of the Platinum Jubilee, uh, Hadrian's Wall became part of the Beacons project. So the Beacons being lit across the UK and the Commonwealth. And to celebrate 70 years of uh, Her Late Majesty's reign. And uh, we were approached a couple of years or a year and a half before we were, well, a year before we were allowed to talk about it by Her Majesty's pageant master. And Her Majesty's pageant master said to me, uh, I was at the palace discussing Her Majesty's Jubilee with her. And when I mentioned Hadrian's Wall, she had a twinkle in her eye. <laughs> and I can't, I can't refute that because I actually wasn't uh, in Buckingham Palace having a meeting with the pageant master and with Her Majesty. But on next Tuesday, I'm going to Windsor Castle at the invitation of the King because of Hadrian's Wall being part of the Jubilee Beacons project. So that's one or a couple of uh, connections that haven't been listed. But um, I was just thinking about this question uh, uh, earlier on. So Hadrian's Wall is just like this compelling thing. Wherever you go in the world, if you mention Hadrian's Wall, and, and most of you here will have a connection. If I was not incredibly happily married, I would definitely have it on my dating app profile that I had an association with Hadrian's Wall because it is just this massive connector because so many people have, have heard of the wall, have memories of the wall, are interested in the wall. Taking on board exactly what Ian said, you know, this, this year particularly, 24th of February, there was an invasion. And we do not forget that for the people who were living here, they woke up one morning and they were <clears> invaded. <throat> I, I'm a bit rose-tinted. I just think everything about Hadrian's Wall is just fantastic and compelling. But I never forget why those people were there in that landscape amongst those communities. So I, I, I've just uh, added the, uh, the royal connection, but it's just like literally everybody is the answer to, my que is the, to your question, Rob. Okay, so no one's off limits to the wall. Is, is that the takeaway? Off limits to and the wall. anyone who doesn't come to the wall yet is just missing out. And so. don't forget, the king studied archaeology, yeah. and the king's two sons were also schooled in archaeology and the environment by one of our uh, attractions along the wall. So actually, we do have quite deep, deep connections with the royal family. Okay, now we're going to turn to a slightly more serious bent then. So looking forward, we've been able to celebrate this past almost 2,000 years of Hadrian's Wall. Looking forward, what do you as our panel see as priorities for the wall in the coming years? Are there pressing dangers or threats to the monument that we need to consider? And what are the things that we can work on to make it better or address those? Uh, and if I can, I'll start with Elsa. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so 
I need to talk about a national picture because Hadrian's Wall, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but that, that does not protect it from any of the wider issues in archaeology and museums across the UK. Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, if you do want to read about this, um, the book um, Hadrian's Wall, Exploring Its Past to Protect Its Future, which is open source, you can get it for free online. Um, me and Francis McIntosh, who's curator for English Heritage, uh, wrote a chapter about this very topic. Um, but essentially, we have a bit of a crisis in archaeology um, nationally, um, and that crisis can be defined by th three broad things. One is a loss of specialism. So um, the Society for Museum the Society for Museum Archaeology and Historic England did a lot of research into this, and they found that only a third of museums have an archaeology specialist. And if they do have one, that specialist often has other uh, duties. So like me, I have to also care for social history. Uh, so we're losing our specialists. Um, we are running out of space rapidly, quickly for the material that's been excavated. So 94% of museums said they were full. Um, we have over 10,000 excavations are sat in commercial units because they have nowhere to go because museums have no space and no specialism to take in that material and care for it. Um, and to get rid of material that museums maybe shouldn't have kept, so for example, modern pottery that's come off an excavation or um, slag or um, unstratified animal bone that is of no historical value, um, to get rid of that material to make more space, the SMA um, did a project and they think it's about £250 a box in admin costs to dispose of one tiny shoebox of material. So nationally, it's a little bit grim. Um, Hadrian's Wall is no exception to that. As I said, the, the branding of um, World Heritage Site does nothing to protect the objects. Um, we are working incredibly hard to address these problems, um, but I feel that across the sector there's a little bit of hesitancy that no one wants to bring their inst institutions into disrepute. Um, but we have to be open and honest about this, we have to start talking about it, because we need long-term solutions to save the material culture that is being excavated up and down the country. Okay, so there's one challenge, space. A pressing issue almost always in Britain, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, Jane, if we move back to you, what, from your position as chair of yeah. the Partnership Board, what are you seeing as, as challenges and priorities? Well, we, we've got a, we're starting really this year um, with our 10-year investment programme. So we have the opportunity to bring down some capital funding. Um, so getting that right, uh, spending money on really what we're, we're sort of calling the gap filling. Because uh, cast your mind to Rob's earlier map in the West. Try, try and visit Hadrian's Wall, the west of the wall, so the west of Birdall's Wall. We, we, we don't tell you where it is. We don't tell you what, it, what it's about. We don't, encourage, we, don't, we don't encourage exploration. It's the most, I mean, the, it's extraordinarily fascinating stuff about how the west is different to Tyneside. Now let's move to Tyneside. Tyneside, one of the really exciting things that I'm working on at the moment with colleagues is the potential for us to have permission from the Secretary of State, that's the Environment Secretary of State, for a braided route along Hadrian's Wall. There's precedent for a braided route because the Thames is a national trail with a braided route. In other words, you, in other words, you can walk either side of the Thames. So we're going to try and get Hadrian's Wall through Tyneside, through, especially through the west of Newcastle, where it's got the most extraordinary Roman archaeology. And if you walk the route of the wall rather than the route of the national trail, which mm -hmm. goes by the river, mm -hmm. what you see is you see garages in the west end of Newcastle that are crenellated. You see people calling their house with, in, in Roman names. I mean, it's just a, a, the most fantastic Vallum Crossing. I mean, the, the Vallum Crossing is in the west end of Newcastle. So working with Chion Wara, who's the Newcastle Central MP, we are working on the, uh, 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 the national trail of Hadrian's Wall becoming a braided route. So that's a really important sort of emphasis for my colleague John who runs, runs Hadrian's Wall for us is to look at the west tell the story of the west of the wall because the central section we do pretty well it's pretty well known that central Northumberland section but we so we're looking to the west and we're looking to Tyneside we're looking to Segedunum Arbea Arbea isn't on the national trail Arbea the place where wherever the Roman Emperor is that's where the Roman Empire is 
Severus, our Bayer, he runs the Roman Empire. He moves his family to South Shields. Do we tell that story? Well, Tyne and Weir Museums, with, our, you know, with the help of Tyne and Weir Museums, we're going to tell that story better. So we've got big plans for Tyneside, and we've got big plans for the West, and then we will just encourage more people to spend time on the wall across the whole of our 73 miles, our 80 Roman miles, because it's, as you can tell, um, I think, the best place. Thank you. How about yourself, Tony? Have you encountered any challenges, pressing priorities? Well, yes. Uh, I think the ma ma ensuring, and we do ensure, uh, it is done, but continuing to ensure that the maintenance of the monument as it stands it's done, is done well. The maintenance of the... Um, Jane mentioned the um, National Trail. Of course, an awful lot of people walk the National Trail. A lot of people walk the National Trail as a 80-mile walk, and they yomp across it in... Um, no time flat and don't look at the Roman objects. I'm not criticising that, it's just that uh, you do get a certain amount of erosion and it is controlled and it is monitored and it is sorted out. The importance is to make sure that continues and doesn't show a detriment to the monument. There are also other natural threats to the wall. I've done, I've done a couple of excavations, one uh, near Chester's where um, the vellum mounds were being were basically a rabbit warren uh, we excavated underneath the valor mounds is the evidence of the prehistoric cultivation with all the pollen and all the other material to show that and of course it's the soft bit that the rabbits like to d delve into um, there was there had been in the past uh, a very uh, well-meaning um, intervention where um, chicken wire was laid under the turf across where the rabbits uh, used to burrow, and of course the rabbits got behind the chicken wire, and it's a huge warren behind the chicken wire um, in, in there. Things like that, natural threats that we don't think about. Um, the cemetery at Bird Oswald, we did, we did an excavation there in 2009. The reason for the excavation was was a massive landslip mm -hmm. of land into the River Irving. And when we excavated, uh, we excavated a, a sort of strip 15 metres wide along the whole of that erosion scar in order to remove all the archaeology so it w was no longer threatened because it had gone we'd excavated it um you know in 50 years time someone will have to do the next 15 meters because more of it will have gone maybe but um that natural erosion actually we had a, a third a 40 meter long stretch of uh, one side of an enclosure and the other side of the enclosure went eight meters and then there was the cliff so we've lost enormous amount to river island erosion so i don't I can't think of anywhere else where there are similar uh, erosive threats, but keeping an eye on that kind of thing, natural threats, not just man-made threats, I think, and, and that maintenance issue, which is, which is I'm not, I'm not criticising, I'm saying it has to continue, not uh, that it isn't happening. Is that sort of uh, natural erosion, climate change, is that something that you've encountered in your field working in? Yes, thank you. Mm. Um, absolutely. I mean, what we are seeing are dramatic threats to the World Heritage Site. Mm. Of all places, one might think that it is somehow safe and unchanging, but that is not true. We can see again and again, I mean, Tony's mentioned uh, Bert Oswald, um, 2009 intervention, Beckfoot Roman Cemetery eroding out onto the beach year on year. And now, with new monitoring that's being put in at Vindolanda and Magna, we are scientifically measuring the dewatering of these sites, and it is already very clearly destroying the archaeology beneath our feet. And uh, just to draw an example from Vindolanda's most recent season, as excavators proceeded down to the Antonine <laughs> layers, they found that there were holes where deeper deposits had dried out. Yeah. Now, what does that mean at a place like Vindolanda or at Magna or a number of other sites where we have these waterlogged deposits that can change our reading of history, where we have literally archives of documents and material culture that otherwise will be destroyed? 
it means it is actually season by season disappearing. So climate change is a very real and present threat. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we have to look, not just you know, gratifying academic curiosity, at stepping up the pace of excavation in some of these areas. Um, I think if I may, there are a couple of other things that, that strike me really important that are linked to the themes that we've, we've had here. One of them is that that also brings back the question of resource. We as a country are getting poorer. We know that, and it's painful, isn't it? Uh, heritage is an easy one to start cutting because it somehow seems like an, a, an elite conceit rather than something we pass to the next generation. We're going to have to think about that, and having had the privilege to work with several very effective expert government bodies, such as Historic England, I think of especially, I'm aware of how they are suffering cuts which impact on the levels of expertise that we have to share. And I think it reminds us all that one of the big challenges has got to be participation. We need as many people participating in this in as many ways as possible. And that is partly, perhaps, an antidote to some of the current malaise and misery out there, because participating on a common endeavour like this is a great way to raise morale. Um, but we also need to look at the nature of participation. Are we continuing to engage enough people in the wall? It's got great stories, um, international stories to tell. Let's see if we can build, therefore, a consensus to move forward on that. Thank you. So things to consider as we move forward and, and things to, to take to heart as well if you are interested and engaged with Hadrian's Wall. And to wrap us up, I have a final question for all of you in a, a brief, brief uh, zingy one sentence marketing pitch as it were. Hadrian's Wall, what is the big deal? What makes the wall so special in your view? And I'll just go right down the line. So we'll start with you, Jane. Well, I don't know. I think you make your mind up that this group of people tonight that we've all got completely different interactions with it, but it's just this compelling place. It's just this, com it's just this compelling pl place in our heart. So, so I'm from Harrogate, and I go back to Harrogate, and my heart doesn't sing. And I live in York, which is fantastic. It's the legionary fortress, but my soul doesn't sing. I go to Hadrian's Wall, and my heart and my soul sing. <clears throat> okay, so Hadrian's Wall, it will make your heart sing. It makes your heart sing. Okay, Tony. I'm with Jane, actually. I'm with Jane, apart from the, apart from the it's been, been, you know, my academic career, my, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, archaeological obsession. Um, I actually, one thing that hasn't been mentioned tonight, actually, and perhaps worth mentioning, I counted the number of books on Hadrian's Wall that I have on my shelves, not including guidebooks, and uh, I lost count at 50. There are 15 uh, words of ancient literature on Hadrian's Wall. Only 50. Hadrian was the first to build a wall 80 miles long to separate the Romans from the barbarians. Everything else we know about it is derived from archaeology. And that, I think, is special. But, I mean, if a personal anecdote, I, when I moved up here in 87 to dig on Hadrian's Wall, I moved into a small hamlet in Cumbria. I lived there for seven years before English Heritage Historic England moved me to Portsmouth. <laughs> I had to sell my cottage and move to Portsmouth. I swore I'd be back. It took me 27 years. <laughs> and now I am a home worker in the same hamlet, 300 metres away from my old house. And I'm happy. Mm. Elsa. Um, I mean, I know we spoke about this a lot, but I do think it is people. I think it's, mm. um, Hadrian's Wall brings people together and incites a curiosity that I don't think any other monument or site really does and the fact that it's what's so special about it is that it's probably is it the most difficult like legally speaking monument that exists the amount of landowners a and land, yeah, over a landowners. it's yeah. bonkers and the amount we've got many museums many organizations um and the fact that everybody agrees that we have to work together to bring out the best in this place mm. i think that's what makes it so special thank you and how about you, Ian? Um, you can argue that the decision taken around about 122 to build a wall was the most fast-reaching decision in terms of transforming settlement and lives in Britain right up until the Industrial Revolution. You can argue it. As I said earlier on, it's been commented, you know, it's an act of violence, but it's 
bigger story is so much more than that. This is a place where people could come from Iraq, Syria, Africa, as well as right in the same neighbourhood and build meaningful lives. So unlike Jane and Tony, it doesn't make me sing, but occasionally when I take a walk along the wall, I also forget all of the academic side and I want to write poetry because I think, frankly, a lot of it is beautiful and provoking yeah. and just makes one think about this wonderful place and its people. Thank you very much. That draws our official discussion to a close, so if you would please join me in applauding our panellists.